We begin this week in 1 Peter. We begin in 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter one, verses one and two. <clears throat> First Peter chapter one, verses one and two. I remind you, this is God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Let's pray. O oh Lord, we delight in this word and we give thanks to you. We ask, Lord, that you would bless it to the reading. Uh, bless the reading and the preaching of your word to our hearts, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it, it seems to me that we ought to review what we understand and know about Peter, and maybe we don't really know Peter very well, but Peter is from Bethsaida. All of these things are affirmed in various scriptures, and I, uh, rather than share with you all the particular scriptures, I'll uh, ask you if you have any questions about them. I'm happy to answer afterwards and point you to the particular scriptures that affirm these things, but Peter was from Bethsaida, and he was living in Capernaum. Both of those uh, towns were located near the Sea of Galilee, right on the shore. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9.5 says that he was married, or it suggests that he was. Uh, he, James, and John were fishermen partners in a very profitable fishing business. Uh, he was one of the first followers of Jesus. He met Jesus through his brother Andrew, who Andrew had heard the preaching of John the Baptist, uh, and John the Baptist had beh said, Behold the Lamb of God. And, and Andrew believes, and he goes and he gets his brother uh, Peter, and he brings him, I have seen the Lord. And uh, Peter comes with him. And uh, initially, there's, there's an initial meet, meet and greet sort of thing, and uh, Peter returns to fishing, and of course, Jesus is there on the shore and says, Throw your nets on the other side. Of course, there's this wonderful, this wonderful miraculous act, uh, fishing. Uh, they've been out all night. They've gotten nothing. And so Jesus says, throw, your, throw your, your nets out yet again. And, of course, there is an overwhelming amount of fish that come into the nets. Jesus, when he had first met Peter, he, he renames him Cephas. He says, you are Cephas, Peter. Rock. Well, G Peter followed Jesus for three years, and uh, he was a natural-born leader. He's a de facto spokesman for the disciples. Whenever they speak or there's a question, they have a private cabal, a private in private interaction. They speak together. Peter's the one who impetuously comes, and uh, Peter's also uh, the first to confess Jesus as Christ, the Son of the living God. And it's an extraordinary statement. And, a statement, and Jesus arrests the conversation and says, God has revealed that to you. Um, and it, it, there's an indication there uh, of, of the work of God secretly and sovereignly on the heart of Simon Peter. After this, Jesus had called him around the miraculous fish story, and, and Peter did this immediately. He followed Jesus from that point forward. He was outspoken. He was strong-willed. He was often impulsive, uh, enthusiastic, brash. He was an ardent disciple. He was a close friend of Jesus. He was an apostle, one sent by God. He was identified in Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, as a pillar of the church. Paul does uh, say that of him. He's one of the three who often saw and heard the intimate things of Christ. Uh, he was there at the transfiguration with John and James. Uh, he was there at the, in the in, inner room where the daughter of Jairus was, uh, was healed. He was there, one, one of the disciples that was committed to, to going and preparing the Passover in the upper room for the Lord. 
It was often within the counsel of the Lord and in the intimate counsel of the Lord. He had weaknesses too. He left the boat when he saw Jesus walking on the water, walking towards them in the evening uh, on the surface of the water. And then he took his eyes off Jesus and he sunk in and cried out to the Lord for him to save him. Uh, he, rebuked, he rebuked the Lord when Jesus spoke of his death in Matthew chapter 16. Uh, and the Lord said to him, get thee behind me, Satan. Um, and he said that it was necessary that he die. And Peter didn't understand at that point. He was ignorant of these things. He was the one who spoke up when at the transfiguration. Uh, there they are at the mount and they see and behold the glory of the living son of God. And he hears the voice of God to listen to him. And Peter says, let's erect three temples, uh, tabernacles. One for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And, uh, and of course, that was insufficient. Um, three tabernacles for three equal persons? No. He is worthy to be worshipped by all. Uh, he is the one in resplendent glory. He is the tabernacle of God with men. Well, Jesus, uh, he, went, he fell to the ground nonetheless when he saw Jesus in his glory. He's also the one who, who drew his sword and attacked the high priest's servant, cutting off his ear in a swift sword stroke, after which Jesus said, put that away. He said he would never forsake the Lord. He said, even though everyone else were to forsake you, I will never forsake you, Lord. And of course, very shortly therein, less than 12 hours later, he did. Uh, three times, in fact. Peter is the main speaker at Pentecost, and he boldly preached, and he did so fearlessly because the Lord had restored him, and the Lord had lifted him up. He healed a lame beggar. He displayed the power of God in his preaching and in his work. He preached before the Sanhedrin boldly. He never forsook the Lord after that period of time. He was arrested. He was beaten. He was threatened, and though he did not curtail his preaching, Peter was present when the Samaritans received the gospel and received the Holy Spirit in Acts 8. He, he, he was pressed by the Holy Spirit and he resisted initially to preach in Cornelius' home. There they received the Holy Spirit and he was amazed and he would be one who would argue before in, in Acts chapter 15 before the council. Uh, they have received the Holy Spirit. How can we exclude them from the church of God? And of course God used him for that. He was also one who acted hypocritically when the Jews came from Antioch and he began no longer to eat in table fellowship with the Gentile Christians. And, Pete, and Paul rebuked him for that, as he records uh, in, in uh, Galatians. Well, Peter identifies himself in this first sentence as the author, and he writes First and Second Peter in 60 to 68 AD, both respectively. Uh, and he, he died traditionally during Nero's reign or, or in the precursor to it, uh, being crucified as Jesus was, though requesting traditionally. There, there's, there's no biblical evidence of this, but traditionally it is believed that uh, he did this. Uh, he, he requested that he would be uh, uh, crucified upside down because he was unworthy to, to be crucified as Jesus was. Well, he's writing this letter to the scattered persons in modern Turkey. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Uh, these are those portions of the upper, upper edge of Turkey all the way down toward Istanbul and toward the western edge. Uh, that's modern day Turkey. They are the extremities of the church in that time. And uh, he is writing to them because they are scattered. There are churches scattered in general regions. Uh, they are throughout the area. Perhaps they feel exceedingly scattered from the center of Christianity, as it were, in Jerusalem and the surrounding churches. And he's writing to them, uh, and, and his intention is to send a circular letter to be passed throughout the region, read for the purpose of strengthening fellow believers in various churches. Now, there are numerous elements that will come up in this letter, in this first of his letters. It's, 
is writing to scattered peoples in a particular geographical region. The church in all of its variegated makeup, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, rich and poor. And he's writing to all of them who are now who now have this, this, this new distinction, this new identity that is Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, children of God. And, it, and he, he largely wants them to understand that that is their primary, primary identity in the world in which they find themselves, above all other things. He's teaching believers about God, and he will mention God some 39 chapters in five, uh, in, uh, 39 times in five chapters. He is, as he identifies him, the living God whose word stands forever. He is the Father, He is holy, He is full of grace, He is the judge of all. He is the faithful creator, and he is the faithful creator who deals graciously with his people. You'll mention grace ten different times in five chapters. Uh, and he is writing to the church, and he identifies the church repeatedly in various ways. The family of God, the flock of God, servants of God, strangers to the world, aliens, people of God, scattered, elect. He also has a, a, a huge priority for the sufferings of Christ. The sufferings of Christ. What motivates suffering Christians? But to, but to be reminded that our, our, our Savior suffered for us and in our place. When Christians feel themselves deeply alienated from the world, we do well to remember the passions or the suffering of Christ. It's mentioned 12 times in this small book. Only 11 times is that word found throughout the rest of the New Testament. Through what Christ suffered, he brought salvation to sinners. And you teach the plain doctrines of Christianity to firm up new converts and aged Christians who are suffering, who are alienated. And so this letter largely proves to be a manual of Christian doctrine and, and, and a further explanation and application of that doctrine to suffering and persecuted Christians. It seems exceedingly relevant to our own time. So there are, there are two points, I think, in these first two verses. And first of all, the question is answered to us, who are believers in the world? And secondly, who are believers in the kingdom of God? Who are believers as they relate to the world? Who are believers as they relate to the kingdom of God? So first, that first question, who are believers in the world? Well, they're aliens, and that's an odd word that sticks out to us immediately as we come to this passage. Peter, an apostle of Christ Jesus, to those who reside as aliens. Now, maybe you don't really think of yourself as an alien, but if you're a Christian, if you've committed your life to Christ Jesus, you, you are an alien. And, and the, the roots of that word are simply to be expatriates, people who are resident aliens. In other words, people who live in a foreign country who are going to live there permanently, at least for a lengthy season of time, um, and they don't naturally come from there. It's like a Christian moving to, it's like all of us, up and moving to Nepal or, or Senegal or Thailand or Siberia, and we are not from there. We do not speak that language. We don't have that cultural imbibement. We, we, we are strangers and aliens, and everyone that interacts with us says, you're not really from here. We moved down to Mississippi and went to seminary. And we were in a, I think it was a Kroger's in, in Byram. And this woman, as we're interacting with her, and we're simply handing the change at the grocery counter and at the cashier. And she looked at us and stopped counting the money and said, y'all ain't from around here. And we said, well, no, we're not. And And they knew that right away. And it was it was remarkable that, that even though we hadn't exchanged really two words with her, she knew we were not from there. We felt it, and we felt it the entire time of, of our five-year sojourn in Mississippi as I was preparing for gospel ministry. We knew that we were not from there. We knew that we were not imbibed fully in the culture. We knew that we were not necessarily welcome in the same way that other Southerners, natives, were welcome. We knew this. We felt this in our own country. Imagine how that would feel living in a foreign country where we do not know the language. 
a funny story. We, we actually were asking for where we could find a grinder to eat. Uh, we were looking for a grinder. You know, we all know what grinders are. Grinders are length, you know, sandwiches about a foot long filled with whatever kinds of meats that we, we would wish for. And we asked someone and they said, y you mean like, like a meat grinder? You grind? And we're in a restaurant and she's saying, you mean you want to grind your own meat? That's not, this is not the place for that. And well, that, that it just shows that, that even, even within our own country, there are dialectical differences, there are regional differences, regional cultures, differences amongst people. And yet Peter uses this word aliens. Scripturally, the word simply means one who comes from a foreign country into a city or a land to reside there by the side of the natives, hence they're strangers sojourning in a strange place. I've spoken to dear friends who have moved up to Vermont, and they have said, even though we have lived here 30 years, it is widely known that we are not natives, that we do not belong here. Uh, it's, it's like that, and it's, it's worse so uh, for the Christian. We are aliens living in a strange world. This is not the only time that Peter will use this language. He'll use it in chapter 1, verse 17. He'll use it in chapter 2, verse 11, where he says in verse 17, if you address his father, the one who impartially judges, according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your sojourn or stay on earth. It's that very word, it's that very word that is, uh, the, is the root used there uh, 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 that he uses here in chapter 1, verse 1. He also uses the same word in chapter 2, 11. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Uh, Hebrews also uses it in chapter 11, verse 13 and following. All these died in faith, referring to all the individuals uh, from Noah to, to, to Abel, to Abraham, to Sarah. All these individuals died in faith without receiving the promises. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had opportunity to return, uh, pardon me, indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Paul writes to the church, the regional church that is farther away from the hub of Christianity, almost like writing to northeastern Christians far, far, far away, who feel themselves spiritually far, far, far away from the Bible Belt, where Christians are and where Christians are uh, abound, in theory anyway. I've lived there. They need Christ too, just as much as New Englanders do. Paul writes, or Peter writes to them and says, you are aliens. You are aliens. I think there is an inherent recognition of the fact that people who are believers called in faith into Jesus Christ are in fact aliens in the world in which they live. To, to, to come to Christ in faith is to abscond from the world. It is to leave the world Behind in all of the connections that we have made, in all of our infinite connections to culture, to, to family, to friends, and to enter into a very different distinction. Now we belong to the kingdom of God. Now we have forsaken the world and are following Jesus Christ. We still live in the world, but we are no longer of the world. As Christian folk, we looked at we we, we have a recognition that that we don't any longer belong to this world, that all of this world that it, that it embraces and worships is opposed to our Savior. And we have eyes now that can see that. And we see the opposition of the world to ourselves. And, and we, we, we are now motivated by an understanding that we live for something very different. We are looking for that better country identified in Hebrews 11. So as Christian folk, we look at our popular culture and we, 
We look at the social influencers and the singers and the actors and the punkers and the rock and rollers and the rappers and folk singers and people living life for the experience, abstaining from children for personal freedom. We look at workaholics, the indulgent who refuse to work, the Republican strategists and Democratic strategists and Harry and Meghan and Kyle and Travis and all the rest of the people that we see in the news cycle. And we recognize that we are completely different. If you haven't recognized this, maybe this needs to be a wake-up call. You, if you're a child of God, if you hope in Christ today for eternal salvation through his righteousness, his blood and his life, you are not like them and you never will be. And so what you need to do is to step away and stop trying to conform your life so that they would be pleased if they saw you and knew you. Stop trying to be, and I think Christians often do this, we try to blend in to the best of our ability. We make every effort to dress cutely, sweetly, powerfully, wonderfully, so that we would look just like all the rest. And yet we hear the word of God command us, do not be conformed to this world. Rather be transformed. And I, but I think nonetheless that we as Christians think in some way and make strong efforts to blend in. But you need to today recognize that you are completely different. Nothing like them. You never will be. You don't have to be like Kim. You don't have to look like the latest James Bond. You don't, you don't have to dress in the ways that they dress. You don't have to be them. You're nothing like them. You have a different purpose. You have a different purpose in life. You're divided from them by the reality that our Redeemer lives and, and, and that you live upon and are being built up into a foundation upon which he himself is the cornerstone of your life. You'll never be like the world. If you are truly a believer, if you belong to Jesus Christ, you'll never be like the world, and you shouldn't. All of our earthly distinctions and attributes and resources have become, if we adopt the mind of Christ, like garbage to us. They're worthless. So we need to cultivate our conviction and remind ourselves when we are tempted to be conformed to the world that no, I, I too am like the Hebrews Christians, uh, the men and women mentioned there who, who loved the Lord and, and who believed his promises. And uh, they'd been thinking about not that country from which they went out, but rather they desired a better country, a heavenly one. And they were unashamed to call God their God who had prepared a city for them. Your brother or sister, especially the youngest amongst us, You're going to be tempted to, and you're, go you're going to be pressed into the mold. You're going to be tempted to live like the world around you. You're going to be tempted to want what they want, to seek what they seek, to dress in their labels, to talk like they talk, to listen to their music and become just like them. And they would delight in that. And yet that does not delight your Savior. Now, this is no scriptural warrant to somehow no longer live in the world and buy and consume products that are created, that, 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 that are on the Target shelves or, or Walmart. We, Jesus had prayed to his father, uh, don't take them out from the world, but rather keep them while they're in the world. I think that we can dress with certain labels on our jeans and on our clothing and wear Under Armour and all the rest of it without worshiping our culture, without worshiping the, those who do worship culture. The point of the matter is, what is your motivation in what you wear? What are you trying to conform to? What are you, how are you trying to fit in? What are you trying to be? What do you see as your primary identity above all things? A fashion maven or a child of God? A citizen of the kingdom of God? One who belongs to the Lord. 
If you drive around Springfield very long, you'll see people driving cars with Puerto Rican flags on everything. They'll be on the hood. They'll be on the tires. I mean, they'll be, they'll be on the wheels. They'll they'll be hanging from from the from the center console. You you can see that they very much love uh, their island from which they come, and of course they're U.S. citizens, but they love that identity as Puerto Ricans. There's something admirable about that. They know where they're from. They always feel while living in the continental U.S. that. Their identity is primarily found in their home. And so that's how they identify themselves by it. You and I as a church, we need to remember who we are and where we belong. You do not belong to this world. This world is dying. It is evil. It is wicked. It is passing away. God will condemn this world in the last day. And everything that you observe and see and can consume will be burned up. Sometimes the church seems hell-bent on pursuing the world and winning its approval by assimilation rather than proclaiming the impending doom of God's judgment against sin and unbelief. And If you really believe that Christ is coming again and will condemn the world and all of its sin, should that not change our consumer habits? Shouldn't it change how we think about the world and about resources and what we most want? There's a funny thing that happens, well, a tragic thing that happens when people abandon the faith and embrace the world. They take their eyes off the home country and they fall into sin. This last year we heard about Carl Lentz, the pastor of Hillsong. and how He was caught in a sexual relationship with another woman. It wasn't the first time. and I'm sure we'll see him return to the Christian scene. Disappointingly so. Nonetheless, this individual, what, what, what happened? How did he fall into this? He began, he was noted as a pastor who looked like a worldly man. He was so covered with any accoutrements from jewelry to tattoos to a perfectly coiffed hairdo. There's nothing wrong with those things in and of themselves intrinsically. I'm not, I'm not railing against pop culture or any other such thing. Don't misunderstand. But if that is your focus, If you want so much to blend in with the world, you will become like the world and you'll be damned with the world. You understand that? You'll lose sight of the home country. You'll lose sight of what you're hoping for as a believer. And don't be surprised when you fall from such a great height. You are an alien, dear friend. If you're in Christ, you're a stranger to this world. You'll never blend in, not totally. When you become a Christian, there is an isolation that comes. and There's a newfound identity, alien, stranger. And that's you. That's me. Christians are encouraged. Christians, frankly, I think are the only real people group that is truly countercultural. Christians are encouraged to leave the public sphere, uh, are are rejected, expunged from society when, when, when you boldly proclaim, I'm a believer. There's trouble. The minute you begin to consistently work out your faith, there will be ethical questions that will come up and, and they will Im- you will immediately be confronted with, am I about to reveal that I am a Christian to my coworkers, to my family members? Uh, it, it's inevitably going to happen. When you commit your life to Jesus Christ, you will find yourself at odds with the world. Or perhaps your faith is not real. You say, well, I I never really have any conflict with the world. I blend right in. Don't take comfort in that. The world says we don't want you. We don't want your opinion. Don't, Don't bring this ethic. Stay out of our bedrooms. Stay out of my body. Well, it would be costly for you to stand apart from the world and its ethics and politics and lifestyle and philosophies of the age. You are a minority, and you will always be a minority in this world. But there's coming a day when you will no longer be a minority. You will be the the only, you will be the majority, but you'll be the only people 
who will dwell with the ever-living God in salvation, rejoicing in all of our human physical differences, but all that sameness and oneness of faith, one Savior, one baptism, one Spirit, one faith. Now, a Christian cannot disengage or create a countercultural where we say, let's, let's buy this block on the street and we'll all live in those homes and have nothing to do with the rest of the people around us. We'll, we'll just have this communal gathering together. What a wonderful thing it would be to only live around and interact with Christians. Well, that time is coming, but not yet in this world. Nor can we so dilute our message that we we just fit in so wonderfully with the world, they don't even know we're Christians. I pray that's not true of you. Jesus' high priestly prayer, I've referenced it earlier, I'll reference it again. I do not ask that you would take them out from this world, but rather that you would keep them while they are in it. Christians are to be salt. Light to a believing world, an unbelieving world. We're not to put our uh, our light in a, under a bushel basket, but rather it's it's to be it's to be the world is to benefit by it to see, to behold the glory of Christ, to see what a Christian is. And so, as you live in the world in which you live and interact and buy your products, you need we need to recognize that we are aliens. We are different than the world. And maybe some of us would, would do well to remember in the creation of our friendships with other people, in our interactions in commerce, in our uniting in business together, we ought, to, we ought not to bind ourselves in relationship to the world at the loss and to our spiritual detriment. And maybe if we do, we have lost sight of this fact. We are looking for a, f- a country of God's own making that is not yet our own into which we have not yet come into possession, but one day we will. We are to live like those faithful Christians of Hebrews 11 who, who believed the promises of God and he, his future provision of what he had stated that he would one day do. And so Christians are always living with faith in a world that does not have it. Those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia who are chosen. Well, we come to that second section. Who are believers in the kingdom of God? Well, elect. They are elect exiles according to the foreknowledge of God. It's an extraordinary statement. It's similar language to what Peter said. And in that wonderful proclamation and preaching of Acts chapter 2 verse 23, This man, referring to Christ, this man delivered up according to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. This man you delivered up, but according to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Same language, same person. According to the foreknowledge, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. That word, Eclectos, that, that, that word chosen or elect, is actually right, right before the word aliens in verse 1. To those who reside as elect aliens. It's very much in view that these people are elect of God, aliens, by virtue of that election. And God calls out a person from the world they become something altogether different. They are no longer of the world. And so they are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And I love the, how this is a Trinitarian language. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all in view here as, as creating this identity that believers have. Elect exiles according to the foreknowledge of God. Foreknowledge is not somehow the informing of God of future decisions of human beings. It's not God uh, coming into the knowledgeable possession of uh, future historical events that will take place in the future. Those who believe in, in the openness of God, which is a ridiculous modern theory that has ancient roots, quite frankly. It's, it is nothing new under the sun. But the view is that God is open to all of basically the sovereignty of mankind, that 
uh, that all mankind is choosing freely and moral, uh, freely making moral choices according to their own predilections. That mankind is choosing, directing, and decreeing. And God is simply responding uh, appropriately to each and every one in their several places. That God is open with regard to the future, but will in some way bring it all in the end to a good result. But that he doesn't intimately control the immediacy of uh, humanity in, in our history. Well, it's nonsense. That's not what foreknowledge means. Rather, God's eternal counsel, his appointment, his approbation and approval explained by the immediate context of verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who, according to his great mercy, not according to his foreknowledge, but according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Things we'll talk about more fully next week. But as, as God saved you, as God called you out from the world and made you an alien and a stranger to the world because of a future decision he anticipated that you would make? No. Rather, he did so according to his eternal mercy and love. It means precisely this, that before anything was made, God determined to create. And knowing of the brokenness of the human condition according to his plan and decree that the unbeliever in, in, is in a position of rebellion against him, dead in trespasses and sins, and he loved you and he chose to make you his own. If you have ever, ha ever had any warmth in Christ, if the things of Christ have ever made any sense to you, if you have believed sincerely and truly, if you have ever known the presence of God with you, that will never be taken away. It means you are a child of God. And nothing can separate you from his love because he didn't love you in real time. He loved you eternally. And that eternal love bears fruit in real time. But he has loved you for all eternity. He had set his love upon you before anything was made or created. He loved you and chose you to be his own. The father is the one who elects and the son is the one who effects salvation through obedience and his death for the particular people of God's own choosing. And the Holy Spirit sent by the son and the father proceeding from both draws calls into marvelous salvation, calling this particular people to belief and faith in Christ, creating new life, causing to be born again through his secret sovereign work and transforming all of us and all of them into the image of Jesus Christ. It's an extraordinary Trinitarian work. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by or by means of the sanctifying work of the Spirit, on the grounds of, for the purpose of, and according to, obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. I want to tell you that in the translations of this section of scripture, especially in that one particular phrase, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. The particular verb there is in apposition to the person of Jesus Christ, not you and me. In the ESV especially, it makes an attempt to put to obey as an activity, to make to obey an activity for you and for me, for, for, the, for the, the aliens, for those who are scattered, for those who are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. At, but rather, in its immediate context, in its immediate placement in the verse, in its, in, in its relationship to what follows, rather it is better to read it this way, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, according to the obedience of Jesus Christ, and be sprinkled with his blood, and the sprinkling of his blood. So the, the point is just that it, it, it's important that we understand that in that verse, he is not already saying, you must obey Jesus Christ. He's rather 
you're saved and elect of God through the, the means of the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and according to the obedience and the blood of Jesus Christ. He's not saying you're justified and you're saved according to your obedience and the blood of Christ. He's not saying that. He's saying you're justified, you're saved, you're redeemed, you're called, you're, you're elect of God, you're sanctified by the Spirit according to the obedience of Jesus Christ and the sprinkling of his blood, which washes away sin. It was in Christ, the Spirit of Christ came and the gospel was, <clears throat> you believed in your heart of hearts and you steadily and slowly progressed in the Christian faith. You've grown in the things of God. You've, you've come to love the things that God loves and you've come to hate the things which God hates and the world is, and its pull on you has meant less and less and that pull is not as strong as it used to be and you're growing in the Lord and you're clinging to God and His grace and you're not relying on yourself. And in fits and starts and little by little in peaks and valleys, we make work in that, we make progress in that wonderful work of God. And we proceed in the Christian life and we become more and more like Christ. One day we enter near the threshold of death and we will enter into the very, before the very face of God, our Redeemer. Until that day, right now, as we live in this world, we have been sprinkled with the blood of Christ and we are elect according to the obedience and the blood of Jesus, our Savior. Let me ask you a question this morning. Have you experienced that love of God the Father? Have you come in faith to Jesus Christ, trusting in his obedience and his blood? the efficacy of his blood to wash away your sins? Have you experienced that sanctifying work of the Spirit whereby he immediately plucks you out from this world, makes you his own, and shows you and causes your, your heart to be awash in the love of God, and you find there's this new desire in you to love the things which God loves and to hate the things which God hates? Dear friend, you are an alien in this world. You, the world is ruined for you. You can enjoy its many blessings because God has given to us this world so that we might glorify him in our stewardship and use of it. So we eat the good foods and we give thanks to God for what we enjoy. We work and we are employed. We give thanks to the Lord for what we have. We ask the Lord for his provision of our daily bread. We interact with our neighbors with the hope that one day they might come to faith in Christ and God might use us in some way in their lives. We build friendships and we have relationships with them, but we always know that there is secretly in our own heart, we know there is a, an immense difference between ourselves and them. The moment we begin talking about the world and what our goals in life are, dear friend, I'm thankful for such a perspective because it, it's indicative of your recognition of the fact that you are a stranger, and an alien, a pilgrim in this world who is destined for a far better country. More than this, I want you to know as you live as strangers and aliens in a world that is opposed to you, when you will experience most likely persecution with regard to your views on life, and as you take a perspective on this world and government and the moral questions with which our country is currently plagued with the calls for justice and righteousness in our world and our, our legal systems. You, dear friend, despite all of the upheaval of the last few years over COVID and, 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 and shootings of people and, 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 and uh, activism and, and burnings of cities and burning of police uh, headquarters and burning of department stores and all the rest of this world and the unrest of this world. Beloved of God, one thing is true, even though the whole world passes away. You belong to your faithful creator, body and soul.
And the truth is that you are an alien in this world. You do not belong here. But God has loved you from before the foundation of the world. The Holy Spirit has sanctified you, cut, sanctified you, cutting you off from this world and making you his own and applying to you the obedience of Jesus Christ and the sprinkling of his blood. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. You belong to the Lord. That is our most important distinction in this world. Elect according to the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, will never let us go. Christ and his work, his obedience and the sprinkling of his blood will never prove insufficient for our justification, unable to wash us clean of our sins, nor will the love of God the Father ever fail. You are a stranger, an alien to this world, but you are elect of God according to his foreknowledge sanctified by his spirit and justified through Christ Jesus, our obedience, our righteousness, and his blood. And so in that we experience his blessing. Grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure in Christ our God. Let's pray. Well, Lord, we give thanks to you for this word. We ask that you would grant us a greater understanding of the truths we receive here and have heard. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to live as strangers and aliens in the world in which we find ourselves. We pray that you would strengthen our desire for that better country. We pray that you would help us to long for that heavenly country that we are not yet physically in possession of, but which has been promised to us, and by faith we understand and believe is ours. Well, Lord, we are not ashamed to call you our God, for you have prepared a city for us. Remind us of this great fact. Help us to keep light anchors on this world, as it were, so that we would not so attach ourselves to this world and so obligate and over-obligate ourselves to so many things we forget that we are citizens of the kingdom of God. We are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to serve the Lord in this world. We are to serve the Lord. We belong to you. Lord, help us in Jesus' name. Amen.